Good afternoon, everyone. We're just going to wait a few more moments for a few uh, more participants to arrive that registered. Thank you so much for being here and for your interest, interest in the Student Health Index. Great to see so many advocates here. Thank you. Okay, I think we're nearing a critical mass, so we'll get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the release and overview of the California Student Health Index. We're really excited to share more information about the index with you today and how it can be used as a tool to advance student health and education equity through school-based health centers. My name is Tracy Mendez. I am the Executive Director of the California School-Based Health Alliance, um, also known as CSHA. A few quick housekeeping points before we get started. One, this webinar is being recorded. Um, two, a copy of the recording as well as the PowerPoint slides will be shared with everyone who registered. And three, please feel free to post your questions and any comments in the chat box. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end of the webinar and we think we've um, set aside sufficient time for that. So a few words about the California School-Based Health Alliance. We are the statewide nonprofit organization committed to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. To that end, we advocate for and support through training and technical assistance, a growing network of school-based health centers. I'll define what school-based health centers are in a few moments. So we help schools and healthcare providers partner to start new school-based health centers. And we also support the state's 293 existing school-based health centers, improve their healthcare services for students through trainings, learning collaboratives, publications, communications, and learning opportunities like our annual statewide school health conferences, uh, which we will also say more about a little bit later. So we believe so strongly that school-based health centers are one of the best ways to provide healthcare in schools that, and, and address health-related barriers to learning, but that we have committed to helping communities across California increase the number of school-based health centers to 500 in the next 10 years. That's because there are over 10,000 schools in California and only 293 school-based health centers. So only 3% of our state's current children and youth have access to a school-based health center. And we believe that at least 1,000 schools in the state really should have school health centers. There are enough equity and access gaps to legitimately expect, demand, and resource this number, just as many other states have done. So this goal also has a critical equity component, and I want to talk about that for a moment. So there are lots of kids who need better health and better health care, and there are entrenched disparities in communities across California that contribute to a lack of access to health care and educational opportunities. And many of these disparities, we all know, and you all know, were exacerbated by the COVID pandemic. So any new school-based health centers, we believe, should be established in the schools that need them most. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, this includes Title I schools that have high concentrations of students, of low-income students, and also in schools that serve large populations of Black students, Indigenous students, and students of color. We know that these students, together with English language learners, LGBTQI+, special education, and those involved in foster care and legal systems are not just at risk or underserved, but come from families and communities that have had their civil rights forcibly removed from them over generations, and in many cases still today. So we know that school-based health centers are only one part of a much bigger solution to these inequities, but we want our resources as a state and as an organization devoted to redressing that harm and that damage. This is central to our efforts to address racial disparities in health and education. So some of you will be asking what exactly is a school-based health center or SBHC is our acronym. Um, and school-based health centers are small clinics located on or very near K-12 campuses. They provide, or most school-based health centers provide 
primary health care, such as physical exams and immunizations, by licensed medical providers in collaboration and coordination with school staff, like school nurses and other personnel. They additionally provide other healthcare services in one setting so that students have access to integrated, comprehensive, and age appropriate care, usually at no cost to themselves or their family. These additional services may include mental and behavioral health beyond the usual scope of what schools can provide, um, may include dental or oral health care, health education and prevention services, uh, and even optometry or vision care in some cases. And many school-based health centers, importantly, also offer youth development programming, such as peer education, peer counseling, or youth advisory boards. And frequently, they help address and navigate social needs that impact health and learning. Although school-based health centers are focused on children and youth, many also help care for family members and or school staff. So the best school-based health centers are integrated within the school culture and help promote a positive health and wellness climate in partnership with school leaders, because no one can do this alone. Most school-based health centers in California are in secondary school settings, and the majority are operated by community health centers known as federally qualified health centers, or FQHCs. Although there are many other arrangements uh, for operating school-based health centers, and you'll hear about one of them today. Funding for school-based health centers comes mainly from Medi-Cal reimbursement, government and private grants, and in-kind support from partners, schools, and school districts. Because California is one of the large states that does not have dedicated funding for school-based health centers, it can be very hard for those operating them to continuously uh, fund the centers over years. Common, hang on. Okay. Common sense and research tell us that health and education are deeply entwined. Children need to be physically, mentally, and socially safe and healthy in order to learn at their full potential. Gaps in healthcare impact students' educational outcomes, and students who face health difficulties and access barriers are more likely to be absent from school, suspended, and have lower GPAs and test scores. Multiple studies have documented that school-based health centers help reduce equity gaps for students. There's a new article from the American Academy of Pediatrics that documents this really well, and Marcel is going to link it in the chat right now. So to reiterate briefly the main tenets of the school-based health center approach that you see on this slide. One, school-based health centers create access by offering free or very low cost health services in a safe, familiar, and trusted location. Students who don't typically use other healthcare services are often drawn to these centers. And this includes those with low utilization of traditional healthcare, such as young men of color and LGBTQI plus populations. Second, school-based health centers provide integrated healthcare focused on prevention and early intervention, which has been proven to be cost-effective and reduces the use of emergency departments and hospitals. They are likely they are linked to other community providers so that they can make effective referrals and continue to manage care as needed. And finally, school based health centers focus on the whole child there. They address trauma and adverse experiences, stress, diet, exercise, social relationships, risky behaviors, and of course, healing and resiliency. School based health centers help connect students to more caring adults on campus which we know is a protective factor for both health and school success. And most centers offer at least some services and support to families, to teachers and school staff who are also a critical part of the, that child's ecosystem. So here is a map where you can see the distribution of our current 293 school-based health centers across the state of California. Most of them are concentrated in the urban areas of the Bay Area, Los Angeles, and San Diego counties. But CSHA has been part of a movement to build more school-based health centers in uh, disinvested regions like the Central Valley, where we've seen a lot of growth, and we're really proud of that. By design, school-based health centers are often located in areas where students face challenges, to challenges related to economic insecurity, immigration, structural racism, environmental health threats, transportation, and other barriers to healthcare and educational achievement. Again, fewer than 300,000 students attend a school with a school-based health center, 
And we believe we need to increase that number. And the data we're discussing today will help highlight that. So we developed the Student Health Index so that we, as we work with our partners across the state and with local communities, we can identify more precisely the areas where the school-based health centers are the most critical for student well-being. And there's no better way to understand the impact of school-based health centers than to hear about them from the young people who use them and the young at heart people who work in them. So it's my really great pleasure to introduce you to our two guest speakers today. Both of them are tremendous people and personal heroes of mine, and they both have deep experience working and supporting advocacy for school health. So first, Irma Rosaviera is a former member of our youth board at CSHA. She's currently our youth engagement associate, and Irma attended a school with a school-based health center in her hometown of Los Angeles. She's been a unique and fierce advocate for school-based health care ever since. Jen Rader is the founder and director of the James Morehouse Project, the school-based health center at El Cerrito High School here in the Bay Area. Jen started as a classroom teacher and noticed that health access was a key to overcoming student barriers to learning. She built a one-of-a-kind health center at her school. She's probably supported thousands of students individually and continues to be a champion for students, social justice, health and education equity, and now school-based healthcare. So after Irma and Jen speak, um, my colleagues, Lisa Eisenberg and Amy Ranger will provide more information about the Student Health Index and what you can do to support school-based health centers in your area and across the state. It is my great honor to welcome Irma Rosa Vieira. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Tracy, thank you so much for all that information, too. And I hope everyone is doing well. Um, as Tracy mentioned, my name is Irma Rosa Viera, and I'm currently um, the Youth Engagement Associate. Um, I was previously on the youth board for about four years, I want to say. Um, so I definitely, definitely, um, you know, live and breathe everything that you guys are here to support. Um, I actually just want to share a bit of my story and how it kind of came about to um, being involved with the wellness centers. Um, it wasn't until I was really thinking about what I wanted to share with you all um, that I, it hit me how long I've actually known about wellness centers, even when I didn't realize it was a wellness center that I was going to. Um, as Tracy mentioned, I, I'm in uh, LA and in LA, I actually um, went to a K through 12 school. So I was there at the same school for all 13 years. Um, so it was very interesting because I got to grow up um, seeing my friends as they grew up with me, but also the teachers, um, which also meant that I ended up developing a lot of roots in that school on my hard days and on my easy days. Um, and the story that I actually want to share with you that was the beginning of uh, me realizing just how important wellness centers are, not just for student success, but also to set up students for a great future. Um, so when I was in fourth grade, um, I'm from El Salvador and my family came here when I was pretty young. So we weren't able to bring our grandparents with us. And um, at that point, and I promise this ends in a happy story. I'll like, this is gonna get a little sad, but I promise it's gonna end in a happy um, tone. Um, when my grandparents were in El Salvador, uh, my mom got a call that um, her parents were um, basically about to be held hostage. And I was about eight years old when I was hearing this. And I just remember my mom like falling on the floor and then she didn't know what to do because we didn't have money to send them. and it lasted over like a whole week. And at that point, I still didn't know about mental health. I still didn't know that there was resources. I didn't know anything. Um, all I knew is that I had gone to class and I love school, y'all. Like if you know me personally, like you know that I'm passionate about school, I will lose sleep over school. Um, and I remember the teacher asking me the next morning, you know, like um, she asked me a question. I just asked, I answered her so abnormally um, that, you know, she got concerned and she asked who I, well, how I was and I just broke down. And this isn't, you know, thinking back to um, me being eight and not having those tools, just the fact that somebody asked me how I was, like changed the course of my life. Um, and what ended up happening was, you know, she took me outside and I cried for like a whole hour outside. And the reason that I'm sharing this with you all 
um, is that I had no idea that what that teacher had given me was access to a wellness center. Um, what happened was that she actually helped create this support group for a lot of students that were going through different things. And at that point in my life, I was just going because I was like, okay, thank God I can talk to somebody about this. It wasn't until I got to middle school, keeping in mind that I'm still in the same school, K through 12, and all of a sudden I'm joining an organization that's like um, promoting health um, for students and just getting access to therapy, getting access to this. And I remember I went back to the same center and I'm like, wasn't I just here like a couple years ago? Um, I thought it was just like another part of class. Like, what is this? And um, I ended up joining um, the club that, you know, promoted health on campus. And that just ended up leading me to um, further promoting the wellness centers again without knowing what it was. And that's so beautiful. I, I really want to share with you all that wellness centers is because it just felt so implemented into the lives of our students at um, Elizabeth Learning Center that it just felt like it was already a part of who we were. And um, just having that access to the wellness center, like now as an adult, I understand like how crucial it is. Um, and it definitely breaks my heart now, like, you know, that I work more closely with CSHA to be able to um, support them. And now with this index too, to figure out, you know, what schools need um, access to more wellness centers because now that I'm an adult, you know, I have so many other responsibilities. It's, it's hard to go back to the doctor on some days. And then just to think back to all these kids that have access to wellness centers that don't have to worry about their parents, you know, um, having to miss school, or I mean, sorry, having to miss work to take them um, because that access is already on their campus. And um, what the other thing that I want to share as well is, you know, having had that on my campus when I was a kid skyrocketed a future that I have now that is way more positive um, as opposed to not having that wellness center, you know, because through that experience, I was able to find um, the LA Trust who is one of our partner organizations too. And I was a part of their youth board. And in high school, you know, I was with them. And now that I'm in college, I'm now with CSHA. And now I get to say that I'm now like a part of their staff. And um, it, it just, it's, it's wild to think that this all started because of a wellness center that was on campus that, wasn't bombarding me with questions. It was just letting me be a kid in that space. Um, so I think um, I'm very grateful to have been able to speak in front of you all because um, I think it's rare to have that experience that you that I've gotten help you know from very early on until now that I'm an adult and now that I get to support um, other you all that are advocates to ensuring that other youth also get the same access and. Um, Yes, yeah, so I just want to thank you all for being here because it just means that you believe in the work um, that we believe in and hopefully we get to continue um, to support you all and supporting more you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irma. It was wonderful to hear from you your experiences and your insight and the energy and passion that you bring to your work. Um, so my name is Jen Rader. Uh, and as Tracy mentioned, um, I came to this work, uh, the school health work um, through my experience as a classroom teacher. And I think that's really important um, to note uh, because I think that teachers all over California, all over the country uh, are face to face with young people every day who are up against depression and anxiety um, and other mental health and behavioral health challenges, both that they carry in their own body, that they're um, in relationship with at home. And so um, it was clear to me as a classroom teacher that I was working with young people who weren't able to access classroom instruction um, because of those kinds of challenges. Um, so I'm in West Contra Costa County, West Contra Costa Unified School District. And uh, we have a wonderful partnership with Contra Costa County Health Services. And so uh, two full days a week, they come to our high school and do um, full clinic services, uh, which includes uh, all reproductive health services. And those are free and available to every student. Um, and then some services that they do uh, are available to young people who are uninsured or on Medi-Cal, uh, specifically dental services and um, 
more extended primary care. Uh, in addition to, to those services, uh, we have a strong um, intern clinical intern training program. So we have 10 clinical interns at our high school. We have 1,600 students. Uh, typically in each year, we probably work um, closely. And by closely, I mean four or five or more visits um, with about a quarter of that population. So about 400 students um, on any given day. So for example, yesterday, uh, my colleague who tracks our numbers, he told me, and yesterday was not a clinic day, so we didn't have um, our medical partners uh, on site, but yesterday over 100 unique individuals came in uh, for some reason uh, to access some kind of service, um, to use our space as a sanctuary, to do homework. Um, the vibe in our space is uh, very positive, uh, very youth centered, um, so that young people walk in and we often literally hear people say, it feels different in here. Um, we meet and greet students uh, by name. Um, they might be working with uh, a counselor for individual counseling. They might be in a youth development group. They might be in an advocacy group. Um, so we offer opportunities for young people to be involved with, what I think, what Tracy named as the ecosystem of the, of the high school. Our evolution over our 23 years of serving students, starting in my classroom and now in a 2,100 square foot uh, health center in our new building, I think tracks uh, our learning and bigger conversations that have been happening uh, in the Bay Area in California and across the country. So that initially um, we identified the problem as it were, or the challenge, you know, in a sense in individual young people's bodies, right? They were coming in, they had uh, traumatic experiences. Um, and so we wanted to offer them uh, counseling, mental health counseling. Um, and we continue to do that. It's a main part of our work. But increasingly over these years, through conversation with young people, with their families, uh, with partners in the community, we became increasingly attentive to the building itself and how a school functions in a way to push many people out. Uh, this is often named as the school to prison pipeline. Um, and so our work now is focused as much on creating um, change systemically as it is in terms of working with individual young people. And so what that looks like for us is that we train and support teachers to understand how trauma shows up in their classroom. So that if they have an exchange with a young person who says F you when they say, hey, can you put your phone away? That maybe it's not about that young person having an anger management problem or not respecting the teacher or not valuing education. Maybe something else is happening in that space. Maybe the student was triggered into a trauma response. And when the teacher is thinking about that, their capacity to be in skillful relationship with young people is, um, is greatly increased. Uh, and so we train and support teachers um, and we do that through a racial justice lens. Um, and I believe that my five minutes is up. Uh, it has been really a deep pleasure for me over many, many years to be in partnership with CSHA. Uh, we're always learning, we're always strengthening our services. We're accessing new funding opportunities, all with the support and, uh, and mentorship of the staff of CS. So thank you for this opportunity to be in conversation with you. Uh, thank you so much, Irma and Jen, for sharing your stories and sharing your passion. It is always an honor to hear from you both, particularly and folks in the field about what school-based health centers mean for you and the students you work with. My name, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Lisa Eisenberg and I'm the policy director with the California School-Based Health Alliance. Um, I also had the great honor and pleasure to work with the graduate student at the Goldman School of Public Policy that did this analysis for us and put this index together for us. So while I have the duty of sharing you, sh sharing about the student health index 
with you all, I do want to credit her incredible work in creating this really valuable resource. So the Student Health Index is the first comprehensive analysis to identify the counties, districts, and schools where school-based health centers will have the greatest return on investment for improving student health and education equity. You've had the chance this morning or this afternoon to learn about the school-based health center model, hear what they look like on the ground, and how communities, schools, and students benefit from school-based health centers. So why are we talking to you today about the Student Health Index? Why is it a resource that we put together with our student researcher? As Tracy mentioned earlier today, there are 293 school-based health centers in California, but there are 10,000 schools in our state. So it's really a drop in the bucket at right now. And we know that there's more need and we know that there is um, more interest in school-based health centers. So despite school-based health center success on the ground, they are still not as widespread as we know they should be. In large part, I think this is because there has been a lack of state level investment for Cal in California for school-based health centers. So in part, that is what we are also hoping, hoping to change with this index. As Tracy mentioned, California is one of 15 states that doesn't provide funding for school-based health centers. And as Tracy mentioned and Jen mentioned, funding for this model is not easy. Um, and so we want to recognize that through, through this work and through this index. So the goal of the index is to identify the districts and counties where there is a greatest need to address young people's health and education outcomes. Thing we, things we know that school-based health centers improve based on research and based on our experience. Um, so the index both provides evidence of the need for more school-based health centers and helps us identify the area, areas where intentional investment could be made to support student health and education. Okay, so uh, if you're a data and policy wonk like me, um, I highly encourage you to read the full report and in particular look at the methodology section to get more information about how our student researcher created the index. But I have um, a little bit of the daunting task to give you a high level overview of how we created, how she created the index um, and, and did this analysis. So um, again, much more information in the full report, but there are three main buckets or steps that I wanna walk you through. The first thing that we did was we identified indicators of student health and educational outcomes. Indicators that sort of got at need for school-based health centers. And the data we wanted to identify had to be publicly available across all schools and areas in California, had to be relevant to the impact of school-based health centers. So we had to find data that, that really got at the benefits and outcomes that school-based health centers deliver on. And we wanted the data to be non-duplicative, so not sort of measuring the same sort of outcomes, and then the fourth component of our indicators was we wanted them to be geographically specific, meaning that the data that was available was small enough in small enough geographic areas to meaningfully differentiate need across the state and within counties. I'm sure you all are really familiar with how, you know, California has 58 counties and how health and education outcomes look like within counties can really vary. We have very, very large counties and very, very small counties. So we really wanted to find data that could get at differences within counties. The second piece that we took on was we, we did decide to include a portion of California's California schools in our analysis based on size. And I, I do wanna acknowledge and admit that this is a little bit tricky for us and did have implications on, on our analysis. So we believe at CSHA that all schools, regardless of size, could benefit certainly from school-based health services and from school-based health centers. But again, there are lots of schools in California, there are 10,000 schools, and we needed to figure out a way to start somewhere. So for this analysis, we did make the, the, the hard decision, um, but we did make the decision to really look at 
larger schools that have a student population size that make a school base that can help assist in making a school based health center feasible. So to that end, we looked at rural schools and non urban high schools. Uh, so sorry, rural school, rural schools and urban non high schools. So urban elementary schools and urban middle schools with an enrollment of 500 or more students. And then we looked at, we included urban high schools with an enrollment of a thousand students or more. So identified indicators, thought about which schools to include in our analysis. And finally, uh, we calculated need scores based on our data. And again, I am, I'm not going to do this elegant process um, and calculation methodology I'm not going to do it the service the service it needs because it's complicated and, and quite elegant actually so I definitely encourage you to take a look at the full report. But basically our student researcher calculated a need score for each school included using um, a re re rescaled the 12 indicators um, that we identified um, and calculated them together for a need score for each included school. And based on a combination of those indicators, each school in our analysis ends up with a designation as, as either highest need, higher need, lower need, and lowest need. So there's four categories of need that we put in our analysis. And just know that the 12 different indicators used sort of were calculated into a final need score for, for each school. And I hope that that makes a lot of sense and I definitely again encourage you to check out our methodology section because it goes into the math and the, the calculations used um, to get at the need score for each school. So this slide um, provides an over, overview of the 12 indicators included in the index. Excuse me. And um, our student, <clears throat> our student researcher in consultation with us decided to include these indicators based on both our feedback as well as looking at analy similar analysis of need for school-based health centers from other states and regions in California. So we included, and, and so we sort of have health and so socioeconomic indicators on the left-hand side of your screen and school-level indicators on the right hand side. And the health and healthcare indicators and socioeconomic indicators were available at the census tract level. And then um, the school indicators were available at each school site. So I'm not going to walk through all of these, all of the 12 indicators, um, but just as an example to call out a couple of the included indicators, we did include, for example, teen birth rate. The Healthy Places Index, which is um, a measure of healthy neighborhood conditions, as well as, for example, suspension rates or percent chronically absent at the school site level. And again, our full report does include a, a fairly comprehensive description of each indicator included, as well as the rationale for that indicator's inclusion in our calculation of need for each school site. Before I move on, I wanted to make two quick comments about the indicators selected and the indicators that we weren't able to include. Um, so first, regarding the, the community indicators, the healthcare indicators, and the socioeconomic indicators, those schools were assigned that data based on the census tract where the school is located. So they had these indicators are available at certain census tract levels, and a school wasn't assigned the, the corresponding indicator score based on the census tract that the school is located. And I do want to acknowledge that, that there's an important limitation to, to doing it that way, because we all know that children do not necessarily live in the neighborhoods directly where their school is located. And I think that that's important to acknowledge, particularly in schools that might be located in higher, higher income or uh, low need census tracts, but the students that attend those schools come from all over the city or all over the county. So I do want to acknowledge that that is, that was a challenge with the data that we just, we had to acknowledge and, and push through. 
We did mitigate that a little bit in our calculation by double weighting the school level indicators because those school indicators are unique to each school site. And so we weighted them a little bit heavier in our calculation of need. And then the second comment I wanna make is just acknowledge that there isn't an indicator included that gets at student mental health. And um, we were disappointed about this. We really, we know school-based health centers improve student access to behavioral health supports. It's one of the great benefits we see in our school-based health centers. And unfortunately there wasn't, we couldn't identify a publicly available publicly avail available data that was really granular enough to differentiate behavioral health needs within counties. So there's lots of mental health data that is available at the county level. We did, for example, look, there's uh, data around mental health related hospital hospitalization rates for young people, um, but that was only at the county level. And when our student researcher included it in the calcula calculation and didn't do anything to um, to differentiate between schools. So we decided not to, we made the hard decision of deciding not to include it. I do think if you are going and looking at need in your district or in your counties that you might have access to data that is available more locally than what we were able to find statewide. And I also want to acknowledge that I do think it's important to think about this data, this data gap, not just for this analysis, but also as our state is looking to invest in school based behavioral health and and where is the data that will help us show that we are making an impact and help us identify where we need to start. So I acknowledge that's a lot. That's a lot of weighty de details and, you know, Data wonk, guilty as charged here. Um, but that is a little bit about how we created or how our student researcher created the index. Um, and again, I refer you to the full report to really dive into it if you're interested. With that, I am going to cover our three main findings that we want to share with you today based on the creation of the index and looking at and, and looking at the analysis that, that this was able to show us. So first, is the index and the dashboard, which I will show you in just a moment, provide advocates and decision makers with easy access to inf information about where to invest in new school-based health centers for the greatest impact on student health and learning. So on the slide, you can see a screenshot of the dashboard. And again, I will, I will show you how to access it in just a moment, um, but you can see that Every school is include, that we included in our analysis is designated by a dot and is assigned a color coded based on sort of the, the need score that was calculated. With red dots showing schools that have the highest need and light, light blue dots showing schools that have the lowest need. So this both shows us information about where there is a need to address student health and learning and I think it shows us that there is pretty widespread need for more school-based health centers. I'd have to go back and look at the full report, but I think more than a thousand schools have a highest need designation. So this is um, a first start at a blueprint for, for where we can grow the school-based health centers to meet student needs. The second finding, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, is the analysis showed us that there are certain areas in the state where there are high concentrations of unmet need. So perhaps it's unsurprising that the highest need schools are clustered in particular school districts and particular counties and regions in the state. So this map and this, this slide shows you the top 10 highest need counties that have 10 or more schools in them. And this was calculated as a ratio of the number of highest need schools, the number of schools in that county with the highest need de designation to the total number of schools in the county. So I 
should have looked up a real specific example. So Madera County is an example of the top, the county with the highest concentration. So they might have 100 schools total and 90 of them have a highest need designation. So that's why they were identified as some of our top areas, perhaps to focus on for highest, for more school-based health centers. And as you can see in the map, um, a lot of these counties are in the Central Valley and in the Inland Empire. So that's at the county level, and we also looked at the concentration of need among school districts as well. So this is similar to the previous slide, but just at the school district level. So this is for each, these are the top, top 10 school districts in California that have the highest concentration um, of highest need schools to total numbers of schools. So again, as an example to help illustrate this, Linwin Unified has 15 schools total that were included in our analysis, and all 15 received the highest need designation in this analysis. And, you know, similarly to what was on the previous slide, you know, these school districts are concentrated in particular areas of the state. So San Bernardino County has three of the top 10 school districts with the highest ratio of high need schools, and the Central Valley has three. So again, we're seeing the same, unsurprisingly, we're seeing sort of the same patterns um, in our analysis. And, and again, I think that this shows us where, where we can start um, right away to address some of this need because it lays out, while, while there is need across the state of California, this analysis does show, show us that there is need concentrated in particular areas. And then the last finding that I, I wanted to touch on um, that is also perhaps unsurprising to those of us on this webinar, um, but that the highest need schools, so the schools with the highest need designation, serve significantly more low income students and students of color than lower need schools. So I think, you know, specifically the index found that highest need schools were, school, were schools on average where 89% of students were eligible for free and reduced price meals, and 91% of students were students of color. And then this is compared to the schools with the lowest need designation, where 23% of students are eligible for free and reduced price meals, and 60% of student, are students of color. So we're really seeing differences in terms of you know, these highest need schools. And I think that this does make an argument for an investment in school-based health centers in, in part using this analysis to really get at some of the equity concerns and health and educational disparities that exist in um, California's communities across the state. So in addition to doing um, this complex analysis and creating this index, our student researcher went pretty much above and beyond expectations to create a one-of-a-kind dashboard that helps us at CSHA and advocates like us, as well as you all, explore the data and findings. So if you can give me a moment, I am going to Stop sharing my slides for a moment and share with you the dashboard. So um, hopefully we will we'll put a link in the dashboard in your chat, as well as there, there's a link to access this dashboard in the slides as well. So this is uh, the website where you can access this dashboard. This is what it would look like when you go to it. It looks a lot like the maps that we saw on previous slides. So the first map you will see shows all the included schools in our analysis with their identified need designation. So again, red dots mean highest need schools, light blue dots mean lowest need schools. And you can explore this map based on your local needs. So let's pretend for a moment that I am the district superintendent for Fresno Unified. I can go up here and look up my school district that I'm interested in, and it'll filter out all the schools except for those in Fresno Unified. And I can zoom in and look at 
only the schools in Fresno Unified. So those are, those are the schools I'm interested in. Um, in e again, each dot represents one school and you can click on the dot to see more information about that particular school. So let's pick a school down here that we can actually see the information for. So you can see information about the school's name, what the need score, look, score is, um, information about the school type, enrollment information, whether or not they currently have a school-based health center. And you can also see all the included indicators in our analysis and how that, and the indicator particularly to, and, and how the, each indicator looks in for that school. So that's an example of how you can really refine the dashboard to meet your needs. I'm just gonna really quickly show you, not show you each of these, but just walk through all the other filters that are here. So in addition to filtering out by district, you can look at only schools that have a school-based health center or only schools that don't have a school-based health center. You can filter out by particular county. You can also change the enrollment size of the school, of the schools included. And you can only look at urban or rural schools. And finally, you can also just look at the schools that have a, a, a particular need designation. So you can look at highest need, only highest need schools or lowest need schools if you're interested. Oh, there's none in Fresno Unified. <laughs> um, so that is an example of the first map and how you can navigate it to get information about your particular needs and then across the top are tabs where you will find some of the data analysis that our student included in the full report. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but as an example, you can look at a different county map that looks at the concentration of highest need schools by county. And you can also look at, you know, the school level indicators that were included and how they break down across the categories of need of need among the schools. So you can like you can look at like the percent of students who are chronically absent based on highest need schools all the way to lowest need schools. So you can kind of see how each indicator plays for the need categories. So that is our dashboard. I'm going to go back to our PowerPoint slides. I hope you're excited, as excited about this as I am. I really encourage you to poke around on the dashboard, um, look at some of the resources we have on our index. Uh, this slide has a bunch of links to helpful resources that can get you started. And again, the PowerPoint slides will be shared after, after the webinar. So you have a link to our website where we've housed a bunch of this information. You have a link to the user guide that our student created that helps you utilize that dashboard. So if you go away from this webinar and you're like, I don't remember how what's on that dashboard, you can take a look at that. We have a link to our infographic and um, executive summary and the full report. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Amy, who will go over with what you can do now that you have all of this excellent information at your fingertips. Thank you so much, Lisa. And yes, indeed, I think your excitement is shared. We've been getting lots of great um, expressions of enthusiasm in the chat and also lots of great questions. So some of those we've been responding to in the moment and the rest we will definitely get to at the end. Um, lots and lots of excitement and lots of gratitude to our um, students for doing this project and also um, to Lisa and Marcel and other folks who worked on this amazing health index. So I'm just going to talk really briefly about, since you all are clearly excited about the value of school-based health centers and clearly excited about this amazing new tool to access where school-based health centers are most needed, you might be asking yourself, okay, so what do we do now? So we've separated out um, some action steps for you, both in terms of the short term, what you can do right now, as well as the longer term as you're looking into the next school year. Um, and most importantly, we want you to leave today remembering that CSHA has many, many resources to help you on your journey now and in the future. So where do you start? Um, obviously use this index to identify schools in your particular district or region. 
um, then download any of the tools that we have available on our website. In particular, we have a robust toolkit on school-based health center startup called Vision to Reality, um, as well as a quick two-page overview that we've linked to in these slides that has all the different steps outlined. And we're actually in the process of updating the, the big tool and adding lots of different downloadable forms and documents like registration forms and consent forms and MOUs that you can just download and then use as you do your startup. And we'll email all of um, you all who registered to, for today's webinar when those are live on our website. And then attend our conference that's in less than a month. We're really excited. Um, our annual conference, which we do every year, is virtual again this year. And while we're really sad to not see you all in person, we love the accessibility of meeting online. Um, last year we had over a thousand school health stakeholders um, join us and we hope that all of you will join us. We have amazing plenary speakers, workshops from California school health leaders and really fun brain breaks with dancing and meditation and things like that. Um, registration is free for all Central Valley and Inland Empire attendees and it's just $50 if you're a member to CSHA. But we really want each of you to bring your whole team, anyone who's interested in school-based health center. So if cost is in any way a barrier, please reach out to us and we're happy to provide scholarships. We really want to get as many folks there as possible. And start getting excited because we're planning to be back together in person in April of 2022 in San Bernardino. So two conferences to look forward to. Then as you're thinking beyond the next days and months, some of the next steps that you can start planning for, um, well, we have our, our key steps to planning a school-based health center fact sheet linked here. Um, and includes the process of forming a comprehensive planning committee, including school and health stakeholders, students and families, local service providers, um, conducting a needs assessment using some of the data sources that are in the student health index, um, identifying potential partners and we can help with that, um, and then brainstorming funding sources, particularly for initial startup costs. Um, and I think there was a question about that. And so just to give a little bit of information, general ideas um, ongoing are to look at school district bond options and also local hospital community benefits. But it's really great that you all are on this webinar now because with COVID relief dollars and then the one-time investments in the state budget for school mental health, plus a potential, not confirmed, but potential new round of federal funding for school-based health centers through HRSA, now's a really great time to be thinking about school-based health center startup. Um, and again, we are here for you. This is what we do and this is why we exist. Um, we're specifically working to generate resources to help the districts and communities and counties that were highlighted in the Student Health Index, um, but we want to help you regardless of where you are. Um, we can schedule a tour of a school based hospital in your region and we have these virtual tours that you can watch. Um, we have all kinds of resources on our website. Um, there might be a regional coalition where you are that we can connect you to, or we can help you start one in your region. And we're here to talk to you um, to figure out where you might be stuck and how we can help you move forward. We do ask that you become a member of CSHA if you haven't already. Um, the cost is really low, but it helps us um, provide these resources to you and others for free. So here's all of our CSHA contact information, as well as Lisa and I's direct emails. Um, and we do have a few minutes for questions. So I will pass it back to Lisa for that. Thank you. I think that there are lots of questions that came in while I was presenting, which I haven't uh, had a chance to read. So Marcel, I'm wondering if you could yes. kick us off with some of the questions that have been coming in. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marcel Reynolds, and I work with California School-Based Health Alliance. And uh, the first question we got was, where does the um, funding source typically come from when states do fund a school-based health center program, or where do the funding sources typically come from? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it varies across other states. I think the question was about how other states provide funding for their school-based health centers. Um, most other states that do provide funding uh, fund their school-based health centers through the state's general fund. Um, so most school-based health centers, um, most states do provide general operating dollars and startup dollars for their school-based health centers. And if you want more details about how other states are set up, you're welcome to reach out to us. We've interviewed other states to ask them how their programs look 
and we we've worked with our state to set try to set up similar similar support for school based health centers. So I'm happy to um, offer some of the information that that we've been able to glean from other states. But by and large, it's mostly state general funds. Okay. Um, we have another question um, related to um, funding and advocacy. Has uh, California School Based Health Alliance advocated through a legislator for funding for school based health centers? And related to that, it's a kind of a multi part question. What is the possibility of using ARF funding at the state and advocating at the county and city levels for these? Additionally, how are you advocating for increasing the workforce of school nurses so that schools work toward meeting the AAP recommendation of at least one school nurse on site at each school? How is advocacy for well, school nurses so, taking oh. place? Sorry. No, no, that's great. Lots of really good questions there. Um, let me see if I can walk through them and I encourage any of my other co-presenters to jump in as well. Um, we, CSHA has worked for a long time, unfortunately, not yet successfully <laughs> to advocate for California specific funding for school-based health centers. We have done a couple advocacy days um, in recent years to help identify legislative champions. I think that is really what our next step is to identify legislators in California that really want to champion this issue, this equity, this health and education equity issue. So we are continuing to do that. Um, we are actually, interestingly enough, uh, we, were, we are doing a similar webinar just for legislative staff next week as a hope of showing this information and showing this data and analysis and, and showing the need for more school-based health centers. Um, you know, we are also advocating for school-based health centers right now to be a part of some of the big investments that are going into school-based mental health and schools in the coming years, both the federal relief dollars and um, the school behavioral health um, investments. And so we, we are looking um, for those to be, for school-based health centers to be highlighted in those as well. Um, I'm trying to see if I'm answering all the questions. I haven't, I mean, I definitely encourage you, if you are connected to policymakers locally or in the state, please let me know. And, and we'd love to partner with you in helping make this case to your representatives. I think oftentimes we can be an advocate for school-based health centers, but if they hear about the need from their local, the folks that they represent on the ground, um, that is, that is, very, very valuable. So definitely reach out to me. Um, and then I would say we partner really closely with the school nurses organization and their advocacy. We see it, this is as, you know, really two parts of, of a big puzzle around school-based health. And so our school-based health centers work really closely with school nurses on the ground. And, you know, we advocate for funding for school nurses for the state school nurse consultant we partner really closely with school nurse advocates at the state level i don't know if i got to all of the questions in your question um but you know please feel free to reach out if i if i didn't answer something specifically and i do want to acknowledge that we're almost at one o'clock um so I, I want to be mindful and thank everyone for joining the webinar and being here for, infor for this information. And please reach out if you have more questions. And I know many of us that were on this webinar and on this panel are happy to stick around and continue answering questions. So definitely encourage you if you've asked a question and you really want an answer to that to, um, to stick around. But, you know, it's almost one o'clock and if you have to jump to your next thing, we definitely want to respect your time. Thank you, Lisa. So um, we have more questions. Where is a good starting point for finding suspension rates for California schools? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, suspension rates are all posted online in the California Department of Education's website. Um, so it depends on what you're looking like, looking for. If you're looking for suspension rates for all schools, that's a little bit trickier to find. And there are spreadsheets that the Department of Education publishes that you can do your own analysis with. And there's a school dashboard on CDE's website um, that does 
where you can look up information by district and by school site. If you are interested in about a particular school or a particular district, that might be the best way to look up suspension rates. And they also break down suspension rates by student categories. So you can also look at the equity um, um, or the inequity, maybe as the case may be, of suspension rates at a particular school site or school district. Thank you, Lisa. Sorry about that. I was just putting some additional information, some links in the chat. Um, we Great, have, thank you, Marcel. <laughs> we have um, an additional question. Um, is there a way to download the data for all schools within one school district? This is specific um, on our dashboard. index. Oh, good question. We do um, we do have a spreadsheet. Our a student researcher was tremendous, and we do have our 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 mother spreadsheet. I guess I can I can call it with all, with all the data. Um, so if you are interested in particular school districts, feel free to reach out to me, and I, we can talk about sharing that with you as well. If if you're interested in in your own analysis, I've I think I've sparked some data wonks, and I'm excited about that. Um, more data questions. So what year, um, uh, what year is all this data from? Will this be updated on an annual basis moving forward? <sighs> um, I don't know off the top of my head which years each data indicator is from. Um, all of that information is in the full report. So if you go to the section on the indicators included, it will it includes information about the year that the data for particular indicators was used. Um, and I would I I would acknowledge that I think all of these indicators are pre COVID. So they are they are a couple years old because that is how quickly we are able to access data um, on a statewide level. Um, is this analysis is rec replicable? We could redo it. Um, I CSHA does not have current plans to redo this um, on an annual basis based on re renewed data, just because you know we had a brilliant graduate student who did this for us. And capacity-wise, we might not have have the capacity. But if you are from a data organization and would like to partner with us on doing this on an annual basis, let us know and we can we can we can think about what that can look like in the future. Um, we don't CSHA doesn't currently have capacity to or plans to redo this analysis in the next couple of years, but it might be something we revisit. And related to that, a question came through who funded your study and what was the total cost? Uh, well, uh, that's a good question. Tracy, why don't, would you be willing to answer that question? Sure. I mean, the um, we did not have specific funding. We did this out of our own sort of operating funds, which and we do have generous funders um, overall, um, such as Kaiser Permanente and the California Endowment. And the cost was really the our the cost of our wonderful graduate students internship, which is I won't disclose here because that seems a little personal, but it was very low and just staff time working on it. So um, I think Lily's on this webinar, so I want to name that. Yeah, I would just, I am a, I'm a Goldman School alum, so I will just plug if you are ever interested in excellent analysis like this, the Goldman School of Public Policy does incorporate these analysis into their education curriculum. Many po policy programs, many social work programs, many public health programs do have projects like this. So. Um, we did utilize uh, that tremendous resource locally, and so do appreciate um, do appreciate Lily specifically and and the work and partnership with the Goldman School. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I have another question. What defines rural versus urban, and where do suburban areas that are high need fit in, like say Van Nuys or the Antelope Valley? That is a good question. I saw that. Uh, I saw that in, um, I don't know the answer to that. I know differentiating urban, um, 
I would have to look at our full report. I don't know the answer to the rural urban designation off the top of my head. I would have to go back through the full report um, to, to, I think it was a census tract designation. I think it is, I think it is some sort of designation, but I would have to go back. I don't know the answer off the top of my head to that question. That is a good question. Great. I, I think um, we had another question. Um, I'm trying to see here. Um, why didn't you use um, ACEs data um, for um, some of this? And, and it's kind of um, a multi-part question, but I think the gist of it was why didn't you use um, ACEs, ACEs um, as part of this analysis? Um, that's a good question. I am not, I mean, I, again, um, I think we, we wanted to find data that was available within county geography. So not just county level data. I think there's lots of ACEs data that is available at the county level, but because we're looking at school sites, and districts that are within county, unfortunately, and this is what we saw with our with our mental health indicator that our student looked at, was even if we had a county county level indicator, it just didn't add anything to include it into the needs assessment because it didn't. It, it's sort of like if you think of Los Angeles County and all the schools inside Los Angeles County, the county indicator of ACEs level doesn't really differentiate between the schools within that county. I hope that answers your question. I am not aware of information about ACEs that is available statewide and that is granular enough. So it's, it's a small enough availability, um, be smaller than county level data. I hope that answered your question. If you are aware of a data set, uh, let us know because we definitely um, we're looking for and a chance to get more at the behavioral health needs and, and we just couldn't find any. And I think would put a plug out there to you all and advocates that I, I do think we as a state would hope to work on having more data available that could get at particularly student mental health needs. Thank you, Lisa. And I have one final question um, that I was able to get down. I think this is the last of the questions. Why do middle schools represent only 10% of the school-based health centers in California? Or why are school-based health centers in only 10% of middle schools? Seems very low as needs are on the rise for services. I agree. And I'm gonna see if Amy or Tracy would be willing to take that question. Sure, I can do it. I think Amy would probably say something similar. Um, I mean, one very small thing is there are fewer grades in middle school, so it's a smaller percentage of um, kids in that setting. But I think the bigger problem that a lot of healthcare providers face is, um, you know, there are two paths of, of healthcare services in, for youth. One is the primary care path in the sense of, you know, traditional physical exams, managing chronic illness, immunizations. Um, those all require parent consent for, you know, all minors. And then there's sort of the, there are the services that some young people can consent to on their own, um, including for sexual health and some mental health and, and substance abuse. And middle school students, one of the reasons um, it's so important and so hard is they're on that verge of where they can consent to some service. Some of them can consent to some of their own services. Um, and the families are often not as involved as when they're younger. They don't need as many immunizations anymore. They've often, you know, gotten their glasses and gotten their hearing checked and their speech therapy. So it's kind of that middle ground. And um, we find that health providers are more inclined to know clearly what's needed with elementary school students and high school students. So that's my interpretation of the, the um, discrepancy. We also have some fabulous middle school health centers in um, in Oakland and in other cities that um, are really strong. And um, I think we're we're advocates of that approach. Um, it's uh, we mentioned funding earlier. I think these are even harder health centers to finance. Thank you, Tracy. 
We have one, the, the questions keep coming. So we have um, an, another one that just came into Q&A. How do school-based health centers interact with the community schools and the grants that were recently adopted in the state budget? Great question. Um, and I think Marcel, if you could actually find that excellent blog about school-based health centers and community schools and put that in the link in the chat, that would be great. Um, we see school-based health centers as community and community schools as very compatible as, as, as school-based health centers, very supportive of the community schools model. I think school-based health centers can assist a school in being a community school by providing the comprehensive health care and services that is part of the community school model. And I would say that school-based health centers really benefit when a school is a community school because the school is oriented around the whole child is or there is staff that can help coordinate student needs and refer students to the school-based health center and collaborate with the school-based health center. So I think they are both strong models that make each other stronger when they're together. I hope that I hope that makes sense. And um, if Marcel isn't unable to find it, I can I can help find it. But there was a great blog post written um, by uh, an administrator in Oakland Unified that talks about the school-based health centers as part of their community schools model. So we certainly see um, the the health services that school-based health centers can deliver as as hopefully a big part of the community schools investment. Um, and we are working really closely with the Department of Education and other advocates to um, share what we know about delivering health services in school settings so that that can inform some of the community schools investments. And definitely encourage those of you that are looking at community schools from a district perspective to think about how a school-based health center can be part of that model because I really do think it adds to and benefits from community schools. Great question. I think that that's all we have for today um, from our very engaged audience. Yeah, thank you so much for being here and for um, getting information and, and like being excited about data like we are and being excited about school-based health centers, which we absolutely are. So thank you for sticking around. Thank you for sticking around past one. Um, and definitely please feel free to reach out to us if you have other questions or if there's any way that we can help you move community, move school-based health centers in your local community. Sign up for conference, sign up for our newsletters. <laughs> Definitely please continue to check us out and, and use us as a resource.